Chapter 4, An If and a But. So pick a bird, the water genie commanded, any bird. This was puzzling. The only bird around here is a wooden peacock, Haroon pointed out, reasonably enough. If gave a snort of disgust. A person may choose what he cannot see, he said, as if explaining something very obvious to a very foolish individual. A person may mention a bird's name, even if the creature is not present and correct. Crow, quail, hummingbird, bulbul, bull, bull, minna, parrot, kite. A person may even select a flying creature of his own invention. For example, a winged horse, a flying turtle, an airborne whale, space serpent, arrow mouse. To give a thing a name, a label, a handle. To rescue it from anonymity. To pluck it out of the place of namelessness. In short, to identify it, well, that is a way of bringing the said thing into being. Or in this case, the said bird or imaginary flying organism. That may be true where you come from, Harun argued, but in these parts, stricter rules apply. In these parts, rejoined Bluebearded If, I am having my time wasted by a disconnector thief who will not trust in what he cannot see. How much have you seen, eh, thieflet? Africa? Have you seen it? No. Then is it truly there? And submarines? Huh? Also hailstones, baseballs, pagodas, gold mines, kangaroos, Mount Fujiyama, and the North Pole? And the past, did it happen? In the future, will it come? Believe in your own eyes and you'll get into a lot of trouble. Hot water. A mess. With that, he plunged his hand into a pocket of his Aborigine pajamas. And when he brought it forth again, it was bunched into a fist. So take a look, or should I say a gander, at the enclosed. He opened his hand, and Haroon's eyes almost fell out of his head. Tiny birds were walking about on the water genie's palm, and pecking at it and flapping their miniature wings to hover just above it. And well, as birds, they were, as well as birds, they were fabulous winged creatures out of the legends an Assyrian lion with the head of a bearded man, and a pair of large hairy wings growing out of its flanks, and winged monkeys, flying saucers, tiny angels levitating, and apparently air-breathing fish. What's your pleasure? What's your pleasure? Select, choose, if urged. And although it seemed obvious to Haru that these magical creatures were so small that they couldn't possibly have carried so much as a bitten-off fingernail, he decided not to argue and pointed at a tiny crested bird that was giving him a sidelong look through one highly intelligent eye. So it's the hoopoe for us, the water genie said, sounding almost impressed. Perhaps you know, disconnector thief, that in the old stories, the hoopoe is the bird that leads all other birds through many dangerous places to their ultimate goal. Well, well, who knows, young thieflet, who you may turn out to be. But no time for speculation now, he concluded, and with that rushed to the window and hurled the tiny hoopoe out into the night. What did you do that for? hissed Haroon, not wishing to wake his father, at which If gave his wicked grin. A foolish notion, he said innocently, a fancy, a passing whim. Certainly not, because I know much more about such matters than you. Dear me, no. Haroon ran to the window and saw the hoopoe floating on the dull lake, grown large, as large as a double bed, easily large enough for a water genie and a boy to ride upon its back. And off we go, caroled If, much too loud for Haroon's liking. And then the water genie skipped up on the window, sill, and thence to the hoopoe's back. And Haroon, with scarcely a moment to reflect on the wisdom of what he was doing, still wearing his long red nightshirt with the purple patches and clutching the disconnecting tool firmly in his left hand, followed. As he settled down behind the water genie, the hoopoe turned its head to inspect him with a critical, but Haroon hoped, friendly eye. Then they took off and flew rapidly into the sky. The force of their acceleration pushed Haroon deep into the comfortable thick and somehow hairy feathers on the hoopoe's back, feathers that seemed to gather around Haroon to protect him during the flight. He took a few moments to digest the large number of amazing things that had taken place in quick time. Soon they were traveling so fast, 
assumed they were traveling so quickly that the earth below them and the sky above them dissolved into a blur, which gave Harun the feeling that they weren't moving at all, but simply floating in that impossible blurry space. When the mail coach driver, Butt, was rocketing up the mountains of M, I had this same sense of floating, he recalled. Come to think of it, this hoopoe with its crest of feathers reminds me quite a bit of old Butt with his quiff of hair standing straight up on his head. And if Butt's whiskers were somehow feathery, then this hoopoe's feathers, as I have noticed the moment we took off, have a distinctly hairy feel. Their speed increased again, and Haroon shouted into Ift's ear, No bird could fly so fast. Is this a machine? The hoopoe fixed him with its glittering eye. You maybe have some objection to machines, it inquired, in a loud, booming voice that was identical in every respect to the mail coach drivers. And at once it went on, but, but, but you have entrusted your life to me. Then I am, am I not worthy of a little of your respect? Machines also have their sense of self-esteem. No need to gawp like that, young sir. I can't help it if I remind you of someone. At least being a driver, he's a fellow who feels fond of good, fast travel, of a good, fast travel machine. You can read my mind, Haroon said somewhat accusingly because it wasn't an entirely pleasant feeling to have one's private ruminations bugged by a mechanical bird. But, but, but certainly, answered the hoopo. Also, I am communicating with you telepathically, because as you may observe, I am not moving my beak, which must maintain its present configuration for aerodynamic reasons. How are you doing that? demanded Haroon, and back came the inevitable answer quick as a flash of thought. By a process, by a P2C2E, a process too complicated to explain. I give up, said Haroon. Anyhow, do you have a name? Whatever name you please, replied the bird. Might I suggest, for obvious reasons, but? So it was that Haroon Khalifa, the storyteller's son, soared into the night sky on the back of Butt the Hoopo, with If the Water Genie as his guide. The sun rose, and after a time, Haroon spotted something in the distance. A heavenly body like a large asteroid. That is Kahani, the Earth's second moon, said Butt the Hoopo without moving its beak. But, 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 Haroon stammered, much to the Hoopo's amusement. Surely the Earth has just the one moon. How could a second satellite have remained undiscovered for so long? But, 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 it is because of speed, but the hoopo responded, speed, most necessary of qualities. In any emergency, fire, auto, marine, what is required above all things? Of course, speed, a fire truck, ambulance, rescue ship. And what do we prize in Ed Brainy fellow? It is, is it not his quickness of thought? And in any sport, speed, a foot, hand, eye, is of the essence. And what humans cannot do quickly enough, they build machines to do faster. Speed, super speed. If not for the speed of light, the universe would be dark and cold. But if speed brings light to reveal, it can also be used to conceal. The moon, Kahani, travels so fast, wonder of wonders, that no Earth instrument can detect it. Also, its orbit varies by one degree per circuit, so that in 360 orbits, it has overflown every spot upon the Earth. Variety of behavior assists in evasion of detection. But also, there are serious purposes for the variation of orbit. Story water facilities must be provided across the entire planet with an even hand. Vroom, vroom, only at high speed may this be done. You appreciate the further bonuses of machines? Then, is the moon Kahani driven by mechanical means? Haroon asked, but Butt had turned its attention to practical matters. Moon approaching, it said without moving its beak. Relative speed synchronized, landing procedures initiated, splash down in 30 seconds, 29, 28. Rushing up towards them was a sparkling and seemingly infinite expanse of water. The surface of Kahani appeared, as far as Haroon's eye could see, to be entirely liquid. And what water it was, it shone with colors everywhere, colors in a brilliant riot, colors such as Haroon could never have imagined. 
and it was evidently a warm ocean. Harun could see steam rising off of it, steam that glowed in the sunlight. He caught his breath. The ocean of the streams of story, said If the water genie, his blue whiskers bristling with pride. Wasn't it worth traveling so far and so fast to see? Three, said But the Hoopah without moving its beak. Two, one, zero. Water, water everywhere. Nor a trace of land. It's a trick, cried Harun. There's no Gup City here, unless I'm much mistaken. And no Gup City equals no P2C2E house, no, wal no walrus, no point in being here at all. Hold your horses, said the water genie. Cool down, don't blow your top, keep your hair on. Explanations are in order and are forthcoming, if you will only permit. But this is the middle of nowhere, Haroon went on. What do you expect me to do out here? To be precise, this is the deep north of Kahani, the water genie replied. And what is available to us here is a shortcut, avoidance of bureaucratic procedures, a means of cutting the red tape. Also, if I must truthfully admit a means of solving our little difficulty without admitting to guppy authorities my little mistake, my loss of disconnecting tool and subsequent blackmail by its pincher, we are here in search of wish water. Look for patches in the ocean that shine with extra brightness, but the hoopoe added, that's wish water. Use it properly and it can make your desires come true. So persons in Gup need never be directly involved, if went on. When your wish is granted, you can return the tool, and home you go to bed. End of saga, okay? Oh, very well, Haroon agreed somewhat doubtfully. And it should be said with a little regret, because he had been looking forward to seeing Gup City and learning more about the mysterious processes too complicated to explain. Tip top tight cried If in great relief. Good sport, prince among men, popular choice, and hey, presto, wish water ahoy. But paddled carefully toward the patch of brightness at which If was eagerly pointing, and came to a halt by its edge. The wish water gave off so dazzling a light that Haroon had to avert his gaze. Now If the water genie reached inside his little gold-embroidered waistcoat and pulled out a small bottle made of many-faceted crystal with a little golden cap. Swiftly unscrewing the cap, he drew the bottle through the bright water, whose glow was golden too, and fastening the lid once more, he passed the bottle carefully to Haroon. On your marks, be prepared. Here goes, he said. This is what you must do. This was the secret of the wish water. The harder you wished, the better it worked. So it's up to you, if said. No fooling around. Get down to it good and proper. Do serious business, and the wish water will do serious business for you, and bingo, your heart's desire will be as good as yours. Haroon sat astride but the hoopoe and stared at the bottle in his hand. Just one sip, and he could regain for his father the lost gift of gab. Down the hatch, he cried courageously, unscrewed the cap, and took a goodly gulp. Now the golden glow was all around him and inside him, too, and everything was very, very still, as if the entire cosmos were waiting upon his commands. He began to focus his thoughts. He couldn't do it. If he tried to concentrate on his father's lost storytelling powers and his canceled story water subscription, and the image of his mother insisted on taking over, and he began to wish for her return instead— for everything to be as it had been before. And then his father's face returned, pleading with him, just do this one thing for me, my boy, just this one little thing. And then it was his mother again, and he didn't know what to think, what to wish, until with a jangling noise, like a breaking of a thousand and one violin strings, the golden glow disappeared. And he was back with If and the Hoopo on the surface of the Sea of Stories. Oh, Eleven minutes, said the water genie contemptuously. Just 11 minutes and his concentration goes kabam, kablooey, kaput. Haroon was filled with the shame of it and hung his head. But, 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 this is disgraceful, if, said but the hoopoe without moving its beak. Wishes are not such easy things as you well know. You, Mr. Water Genie, are upset because of your own error. Because now we must go to Gup City after all and there will be harsh words and hot water for you. And you are taking it out on the boy. Stop it, stop it, or I'll be annoyed. 
truly, this was a most passionate, even excitable sort of machine, Harun thought in spite of his unhappiness. Machines were supposed to be ultra-rational, but this bird could be genuinely temperamental. If looked at the red blush of humiliation that was all over Harun's face and softened somewhat. Gut city it is, he agreed, unless, of course, you'd like to hand over the disconnecting tool and just call the whole thing off. Harun shook his head miserably. But, 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 you are still bullying the boy. But the hoopoe expostulated furiously without moving its beak. Change the plan, please, right away. Cheering up procedures to be instituted at once. Give the lad a happy story to drink. Not another drink, said Haroon in a low, small voice. What are you going to make me fail at now? So if the water genie told Haroon about the ocean of streams of story, and even though he was full of a sense of hopelessness and failure, the magic of the ocean began to have an effect on Haroon. He looked into the water and saw that it was made up of a thousand, thousand, thousand and one different currents, each one a different color, weaving in and out of one another, like a liquid tapestry of breathtaking complexity. And if explained that these were the streams of story, and that each colored strand represented and contained a single tale. Different parts of the ocean contained different sorts of stories, and as all the stories that had ever been told, and many that were still in the process of being invented could be found there. The ocean of the streams of story was, in fact, the biggest library in the universe. And because the stories here were held in fluid form, they retained the ability to change, to become new versions of themselves, to join up with other stories, and so become yet other stories, so that unlike a library of books, the ocean of the streams of story was much more than a storeroom of yarns. It was not dead, but alive. And if you are very, very careful or are very, very highly skilled, you can dip a cup into the ocean, if told Haroon, like so. And here he produced a little golden cup from another of his waistcoat pockets, and you can fill it with water from a single pure stream of story, like so. And he did precisely that. And then you can offer it to a young fellow who's feeling blue so that the magic of the story can restore his spirits. Go on now. Knock it back. Have a swig. Do yourself a favor, if concluded. Guaranteed to make you feel a number one. Haroon, without saying a word, took the golden cup and drank. He found himself standing in a landscape that looked exactly like a giant chessboard. On every black square, there was a monster. There were two-tongued snakes and lions with three rows of teeth and four-headed dogs and five-headed demon kings and so on. He was, so to speak, looking out through the eyes of the young hero of the story. It was like being in the passenger seat of an automobile. All he had to do was watch. While the hero dispatched one monster after another, and advanced up the chessboard toward the white stone tower at the end. At the top of the tower was, what else but, a single window, out of which there gazed, who else but, a captive princess. What Haroon was experiencing, though he didn't know it, was Princess Rescue Story Number S1001ZHT42041R11. And because the princess in this particular story had recently had a haircut and therefore had no long tresses to let down, unlike the heroine of Princess Rescue Story G110RIM777MW1, better known as Rapunzel, Haroon, as the hero, was required to climb up the outside of the tower by clinging to the cracks between the stones with his bare hands and feet. He was halfway up the tower when he noticed one of his hands beginning to change, becoming hairy, losing its human shape. Then his arms burst out of his shirt and they too had grown hairy and impossibly long and had joints in the wrong places. He looked down and saw the same thing happening to his legs. When new limbs began to push themselves out from his sides, he understood that he was somehow turning into a monster just like those he had been killing. And above him, the princess 
caught at her throat and cried out in a faint voice, Eek, my dearest, you have turned into a large spider. As a spider, he was able to make rapid progress to the top of the tower, but when he reached the window, the princess produced a large kitchen knife and began to hack and saw at his limbs, crying rhythmically, Get away, go, get away, spider, go back home. And he felt his grip on the stones of the tower grow looser, and then she managed to chop right through the arm nearest her, and he fell. Wake up, snap out of it, let's have you, he heard If anxiously calling. He opened his eyes to find himself lying full length on the back of Butt the Hoopo. If was sitting beside him looking extremely worried and more than a little disappointed that Haroon had somehow managed to keep a firm grip on the disconnecting tool. What happened? If asked. You saved the princess and walked off into the sunset as specified, I presume? But then why all this moaning and groaning and turning and churning? Don't you like princess rescue stories? Haroon recounted what had happened to him in the story, and both If and But became very serious indeed. I can't believe it, If finally said. It's a definite first without parallel, never in all my born days. I'm almost glad to hear it, said Haroon, because I was thinking that wasn't the most brilliant way to cheer me up. It's pollution, said the water genie gravely. Don't you understand? Something or somebody has been putting filth into the ocean. And, and obviously, if filth gets into the stories, then they go wrong. Hoopo, I've been away on my rounds too long. If there are traces of this pollution right up here in the deep north, things at Gup City must be close to crisis. Quick, quick, top speed ahead. This could mean war. War with whom, Harun wanted to know. If and but shivered with something very like fear the land of Chup, on the dark side of Kahani. But the hoopo answered without moving its beak, This looks like the doing of the leader of the Chupwalas, the cult master of Bezabon. And who's that? Haroon persevered, beginning to wish he'd stayed in his peacock bed instead of getting muddled up with water genies and disconnecting tools and talking mechanical hoopos and story oceans in the sky. His name whispered the water genie, and the sky darkened for an instant as he spoke it. Is Katam shunned? Far away on the horizon, forked lightning glittered once. Haroon felt his blood run cold.